Okay, so what are then if we broaden out a little bit, and we're not just speaking of Whitehead here, although we are, but wider than Whitehead too, or, or panentheistic visions. What are some of the common themes? These themes that I want to list are important, and they come from uh, Michael Brearley, who is a, a thinker who's done a lot of work on the sort of panentheistic style thought. One we already mentioned is panentheistic themes, that the world is imagined to be God's body, right? And this also is an ancient intuition um, of, of various cultures, Ramanuja in the Indian tradition, arguably in some Chinese traditions, depending on how you understand that. Right? But that this sense of intimacy, that God relates to the world in the way that you relate to your body. Right? So there almost could not be a more intimate understanding. Okay, Language of in and through, right? If you have various positions talking about working in and through the reality of the world, right? these positions are often seen to be panentheistic in orientation. Another theme is the cosmos as a sacrament, right? A physical mediator of the workings of God. It's something under, in, and through which the reality of God is made present, right? This has a certain panentheistic undertones to it. A similar uh, element of language, this language of inter inextricable intertwining, okay? <laughs> it's a sort of a mouthful there. Again, the, the God cosmos, they're distinct, but they're inseparable, right? Independent inseparability. They're mutually imminent. Difference but inseparable. Okay, the language of, of God being dependent on the cosmos, that in a deep sense, God really needs the cosmos to fulfill the divine aims. And if one wants to deny this, well, they can. But why should we have a world then? Okay, we, it either it has always been this way in some deep sense, or where something about the nature of God uh, requires it, right? I mean, there's different theological arguments and points here. Okay, another theme of this panentheistic vision is the intrinsic positive value of the universe. And if we keep, keep with this theme of the universe as God's body, God is claimed to be good. Therefore, the body of God is also good. Okay, think of the, uh, some of the ecological undertones that are important in, in this sort of vision. Again, we're broadening out a little bit. Okay, passability, the notion that snuffers, excuse me, God suffers with God's body, right? God suffers when God's body suffers. You suffer when your body suffers. Imagine the intimacy that's in, involved in that. Okay, and finally, uh, what's called degree Christology. So when process thinkers develop Christologies, and they tend, and they have done this, I hope uh, you'll get into this in further sessions, they tend to see Christ as different in degree rather than kind, right? Um, and, and that's a point we won't get into now, but it has some significant bearing on how we think about the Christological kinds of questions and the questions of uniqueness of Christ, at least for the, the uh, Christian tradition. Okay, so what are some panentheistic images? I love these images. Think about the world as in the womb of a cosmic mother, right? And again, these are also ancient, ancient images that we have that intersecting in our different cultures, right? The, the world, in some sense, is within the womb. The cosmic mother. The world is something for itself, and yet at every moment surrounded by the activity and the embrace, if you want, of, of God. There's a sense of imminence, there's a sense of transcendence in that relationship. The mother transcends the child, and the child is imminent within, and yet the sense that she's always present. Okay, another image is, is going to be this notion of a fish in water. It's a sort of popular image that, uh, that some panentheistic uh, leaning thinkers have have brought into the conversation. So we should say something then about if this is the case, if this image, this more panentheistic style image is, is how uh, process thinkers view things, Whitehead included, then how does it relate to the way classical uh, attributes have been understood? Okay, just a quick comparison, right? On the one hand, a transcendent God is pictured as outside time, Whereas process panentheism is wanting to say, yes, God has a domain of transcendence, but I was actively imminent with any and all worlds. Okay. Classical attribute of self-sufficiency, God really needs nothing versus a dynamic relational interaction. God is in a need relationship with the world. There's something about the world that fulfills God. Like how can God be a creator? How could God ever be called a creator if there's, if there's no creation in some sense? Right, so uh, questions of, of creation. Omnipotence, God has all the power there is, is able to do anything. That's not self-contradictory. Classical theism will make that point. 
And process theism wants to make process panentheism that God's power is always persuasive. It's always relational. It's never coercive to quote time Ward, God can't. Okay. God can't do the kinds of things you would hope a king would do. God can't interrupt the world and make everything better. It's a harsh realization. But you know who can? You can. If you're attuned to the life, the call of God, you are the only hands that God has. This is not an interesting, uh, not a, it is interesting. It's not a, it's not an easy idea. Okay, omniscience, according to the classical vision, God knows all things, past, present, and future, as in one now. He knows them as settled. For process panentheism, God knows all possibilities. Anything at all that's possible, God knows, but God does not know what you will do with them. Okay? It's an image of an open future where God knows all that can be known, all that is possible, but leaves the moment of creative self-determination to you. Part of what an open future means is that it's not settled, and it's not settled for God. Process panentheism as an adventurous movement of God and the world into the future together. Uh, the language of impassibility classically understood is that God does not feel or have emotion or suffer. Whereas process panentheism is based fundamentally on a feeling God. God suffers with the world. God feels the world as the world feels itself. Okay, Classical attribute of immutability, God never changes. Okay, Whereas process panentheism says God is always influenced, impacted, and changing and growing with the world. Right? Not for the worst, but changing the sense of real relationship, even though, as we saw last time, God and God's primordial nature is unchanging. It's an unchanging character, but a body that changes. Okay?